Hello, I'm Tiago. I'm here to present our work, Juggler Multi Stakeholder Ranking with Meta Learning. This work has been done with Ioannis and Fong at Expedia. So, first, let me walk you through the multi objective ranking problem in Expedia. So, the ranking that we produce for hotels uh, needs to take into account the objectives from three uh, groups of stakeholders. So, the providers, which are the hotels, the consumers, which are the customers, and the system, which is the marketplace itself. So, Instance, providers want to have exposure. Otherwise, if they are not shown to customers, they cannot be bought. They want to sell inventory and maximize the profit. Consumers, on the other hand, want to have good um, pro properties, cheap and uh, great location and uh, the better, uh, best amenities possible. The system itself wants to maximize sales and also its margin, uh, but it also needs to take into account marketplace health uh, objectives. So all this needs to go into the ranking. And how do we do it? We do it by summing uh, over multiple components. Uh, one of the, each of the components is, uh, as we design and tune to cater to a few of these objectives. And in the end, we sum all uh, in a posteriori fashion. Uh, so here we have an example where we sum the utility and compensation. Utility refers to how good is this property for the customer. Uh, and the compensation is linked to the margin we received from, um, from each property. In the end, we sum all the scores, including some that are hidden here to create the final score, and then we rank them uh, accordingly. And this gives us the final uh, result. Uh, one of the main problems here is that we take, do not take into account the context. Uh, so these adjustments might uh, are defined and uh, are tuned on a global basis, uh, but they are suboptimal for different types of contexts. So it makes sense for us to look into how can we uh, go into more granularity here in this solution. And we look at literature and we found the linear scalarization. Essentially, we assign a weight to each adjustment or component and we sum over all of it. So this means that we have a, a natural representation from the, what we had before to what we want to do. So we have a weight for utility, weight for compensation. We also include the remaining adjustments, although we do not weight them. Uh, and this way, we can have a specific weight or set of weights for each uh, uh, search, and we can optimize them for several objectives. So this opens a lot of uh, possibilities. So we look at the related work and we found that most approaches look at Pareto optimization and evolutionary algorithms. Uh, which are able to find the ideal solutions for search, uh, although they are usually def defined in the domain specific solution. Uh, but the, the, the big disadvantage for us is that it's too expensive to use them in online inference. So to answer that, we have proposed to, use, to we have proposed Juggler to use, which uses meta learning. And although we find approximate solutions, we looked at the past um, interactions that the customer had with the system and try to find which is the best solution and look at these patterns. Um, the good thing about this is that this framework is extensible to other ranking problems because we made it as generic as possible and it serves the main purpose, which although it is expensive to train, it's fast at inference. So the framework can be uh, divided into two components. The first, the model training, the second model inference. In model training, we generate the model by first performing simulation. So we look at different sets of weights for a search and we find out which is the best one. Uh, and then we also look at that search and it's described, uh, describe it, which is its context. So by summarizing through uh, extracting meta features. Once we have both, we can create meta examples and then simply uh, fit a, a classification model to create this meta model. At inference time, uh, search comes is subjected to the same uh, meta feature extraction process, and then we make predictions. With these new weights, we re rank the items at, um, at real time. So we will focus the talk on these two components on how we perform the simulations and how we extract the features to create meta examples. So, first, we need to go from the goals to the metrics, and we know that we want to maximize. Uh, a set of goals. And if we are looking at a simple single objective, uh, for instance, price, uh, we want to have to compare any simulated ranking with the ideal ranking. And the ideal ranking from a customer point of view is to have the shorter price, the lowest price possible, right? So the ideal ranking here is we sort all properties in a search in an ascending order 
And then we compare how close is the current uh, simulated ranking is to this ideal ranking. However, if you look at fairness, uh, we want to make sure that we have a fair distribution over K protected classes. And that means that uh, we need to make sure as many classes as possible are represented. And we have found this uh, metric in the literature, which help us uh, uh, in ensure that this happens. So a policy for us is simply a set of objectives. Uh, and we have defined several uh, policies. It's not an exhaustive list, but we have tried to find different subsets that look at different stakeholders and different combinations. Uh, more should be could be included, uh, but we find this is a representative set to validate the framework. So we have the policies, the set objectives, and now we need to define the metal labels, which are the actual ways to be defined for this policy. And we know that different policies will have different uh, uh, weights, preferred weights. So how do we explore the objective space to make sure that happens? So first, and here we consider just two adjustments for simplicity, we constrain the objective to a range which we feel uh, uh, comfortable in having the weights vary. So uh, this comes from a domain knowledge. And then what we do is we partition this objective space into sections. So we, se we select five sections, which means we will have five metal labels. Uh, we have one section in the middle, which is a balanced approach. So uh, we are closer to the default setting, although we do explore uh, weights beyond the default one one. Uh, and we also look at the extremes because we know that in order to change the ranking, uh, different changes in weights might not be necessary. So we are more interested in finding the weights that ensure a larger uh, change in ranking than a smaller one, because the payout and the differences in ranking will be different. Uh, we discretize these uh, sections, and then we create candidates. Candidates are each of these points. And then from these, what we can do is to create a solution. A solution is a set of candidates, candidates one candidate per section. Uh, and if we have all this set of solutions, we can evaluate them on all of these, and then we identify the best one. And on the, on the other hand, what we do to extract the features is we look at ranking histograms and ranking correlations. So the first ones are used to take the search and summarize any feature through an histogram. Uh, for instance, look at the price distribution. Uh, and the other one looks at ranking correlations. So we look at the scores in different ways and try to understand how much does an adjustment impact the overall score. So uh, and overall ranking. And all these will be uh, interesting to predict the weights for said weights, said adjustments. Um, the experimental study we have done um, uses 6 million searches from 2019, and we do perform simulations on a set of 1 million searches. We have used uh, light GBM and we have turned with hyper opt. Uh, we have selected only one algorithm to show, although we have uh, tested several. Uh, in, the, in our experiments. Uh, the reason being that it's not really interesting to, to have multiple models on the same framework. Otherwise, that's just trying to find the best, uh, uh, the most meaningful algorithm. Uh, but the interesting part here is how to generate the meta examples and use them for this particular use case. Uh, the baseline we use is the average ranking, which does not use any feature. And we find this is the, the, the only appropriate uh, baseline because there is nothing, as far as we know, in the literature that addresses this problem. So the features we use are search features, which are used as is, such as the destination country, and for instance, the day of the week. The property features like price and star rating are aggregated through Instagram and the features, and the property scores are uh, aggregated through ranking correlations. So the results here, we just show a subset for two to time. So uh, the predicted, this shows the predicted metal level distribution. And we identify that most policies take advantage of all sections, which is good. It means that uh, the sections that we define are interesting for the problem at hand. And it means that our approximation is useful. And we show that the median section, uh, which refers to the one closest to the default weights, is the one with the fewer predictions, which means that uh, there's a preference towards uh, weights outside the default. Um, and the two weights are suboptimal. So this validates the approach that we are undertaking. In terms of um, uh, 
uh, performance in terms of the simulation. So we looked and we saw that different policies behave differently. So some of them work well against the um, defined uh, objectives. Some work approximately uh, good and some work not as well. And so in, in essence, what we see is that we have a decent behavior against policy expectations, although this is not consistent across the policies. Uh, some of the conclusions we see here on the simulation is that the performance is worse when using mostly fairness metrics, which points us to, uh, to an issue that maybe the group fairness metric is not the ideal one to use in this context, or the fact that there is no fairness adjustment that can be weighted and be directly optimized. Um, then not all policies are easily optimizable, which means we also have hidden adjustments here that we have included for reality, uh, but the, the effect on the simulations may be explained also by these different adjustments. And also because we are predicting global weights. So the weight variability is the same for all properties in the search. And if add, we had the possibility to uh, have a weight per, per property, then uh, the impact should, could be much larger. And we find it's easier to optimize for consumer and system due to tradition, because this is how uh, the, the, the stakeholders that we have paid more attention in the past. And we recognize, and there's been a recent work in, in, within the company to have a shift towards fairness um, so we can improve this. So for future work, we'll improve the policies by including constraints and define some sort of hierarchy between the objectives. Uh, we'll also improve the features, possibly using embeddings. And lastly, we will take a look at the reinforcement learning models to be able to learn on, uh, as the feedback is coming and adapting to the current changes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Blagoj Mitrovski, a co-author of this paper, Momentum-Based Gradient Methods in Multi-Objective Recommendation. Why the recommender systems are important and why do we care about them? 80% of watch content on Netflix is based on algorithmic recommendations. The number of users is large, so even 1% of improvement will lead to a huge impact on revenue. But looking at recommender systems only from business and revenue aspect is a huge downside. The value of a recommender system should be measured by the value it brings to its users. We, sh we should also consider other objectives like biases in, re in the recommender systems, polarization of opinion and the introduction of novel items. There are multiple stakeholders concerning the recommender systems. On one side, the businesses who want to improve the recommender's accuracy and the revenue generates. On the other side, the users who want their recommenders to be fair to introduce novel and diverse content. In reality, recommenders should, should be simultaneously optimized for more than just accuracy. This leads us to multi-objective optimization, an optimization problem in which several possibly conflicting object objectives are being optimized simultaneously. It can be formally defined with the formula on the slide. Unlike the single objective optimization problems, in multi-objective optimization, in general, there will not exist a single solution that is better with, res with respect to all objectives. Thus, the solution is not a single solution, but a set of solutions called the Pareto set. Before formally defining a concept of Pareto opti optimal solution, we first define the concept of Pareto dominance. For example, the green solution dominates the red one. And the two green solutions on this image are Pareto optimal because they are not dominated by any other solution. And finally, the set of all non-dominated solutions is called the Pareto set. Multigradient descent is an algorithm for gradient-based multi-objective optimization. It can be used to develop a recommender system optimized for multiple objectives. The common descent vector is in the core of the multigradient descent algorithm. A common descent vector is a convex, convex combination of the gradients of each objective defined with the formula on the slide. And the necessary conditions for a solution to be optimal are the KKT conditions. If we can find such a common descent vector, which is zero, we say that the solution is Pareto stationary. After the definition of the common descent vector and the Pareto stationary solution, we can present the multi-gradient descent algorithm. 
The algorithm is deterministic and is proven to converge to a Pareto stationary solution. For an ar arbitrary number of objectives, this algorithm gives us a way to compute the alphas to create a common descent vector in a way that taking an optimization step in the opposite direction of this common descent vector, we are optimizing for all the objectives simultaneously. To compute the alphas, we need to solve the following quadratic constraint optimization problem. If the common descent vector is a zero, then we are in a Pareto stationary point. If the common descent vector is not zero, we take an optimization step in the opposite direction of this common descent vector. This quadratic constraint optimization problem has an analytical solution for two objectives, and for more than two objectives, we can use the Frank Wolfe constraint optimization algorithm. Here we have the final algorithm. Before the training, we compute the maximal empirical losses because we will need them later for gradient normalization. We start by calculating the losses, then we compute the gradients regarding the losses. Since the gradients can be of different magnitude, we normalize the gradients using the maximum empirical losses. We solve the quadratic constraint problem, and using the alphas, we compute the final common descent vector. We take a step in the opposite direction of this common descent vector. And after every epoch, we evaluate the model and up update the Pareto set with the new solution. The multi-gradient descent algorithm has stochasticity to optimization process from using mini-batch stochastic gradient descent or using a dropout regularization. This may cause the algorithm to converge slower or even diverge. To alleviate this problem, we came up with a solution to smooth the gradients from the different objectives by using Adam per objective. Adam in single objective setup keeps running average of the first and the second momentum of the gradients and then corrects the gradient using these momentums. So using Adam per objective in a multi-objective setup may lead to more stable alpha computations, faster convergence and convergence to better solutions. To implement this idea, we added the highlighted line to the vanilla multi-gradient descent algorithm. This is actually a procedure called to atomize the gradient. To test this idea, we have the following experimental setup. We use two popular datasets, MovieLens 20 million and Amazon Book dataset. We preprocess them by binarizing the 5 star ratings, dividing the data into training, validation and test sets and we masked out 20% of the items for the validation and test sets. We derived three objectives, relevance objective, revenue objective, and recency objective. We used variational autoencoder models. On the baseline, we used the vanilla multigradient descent algorithm, and on the other model, multigradient descent algorithm using Adam per objective. We used grid search to find the best hyperparameters for both models. From both visualization, we can clearly observe that atomizing the gradient substantially improves the performance over the vanilla algorithm. The Pareto front obtained with our method clearly dominates the vanilla multigradient descent algorithm. On MovieLens, the Pareto fronts are more spread than in, in the Amazon dataset case. The claim is even stronger since we can see the improvement on two different and not correlated datasets. The atomized trick shows improved performance even with using different Pareto set metrics as shown in the table. In the three objective setup, for bet better visualization, we projected the three dimensional Pareto fronts on two dimensions. And from the plots, we observe an improvement in all the three combinations of objectives. The table quantifies the improvements of our proposed method compared to the vanilla algorithm. Supported by the improvements on the two different datasets, in using up to three different objectives, we can say that the atomized trick leads on average to better solutions. Thank you for your attention. Hello all, I'm Sinan Seyman. I'm a PhD student in Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences Department at Northwestern University. My research area is applying optimization techniques to recommend system problems. Today, I will be presenting our paper, A Unified Optimization Toolbox for Solving Popularity Bias, Fairness and Diversity in Recommender Systems. I have worked with Himan Abdullah Puri and Edward C. Maltas on this paper. So historically, the main objective of a successful recommender system is how accurate the recommendations are according to each user's preference. However, 
This main objective is later challenged by researchers and other criteria are getting focused on the literature nowadays. And we created different integer programming models for these sub problems we mentioned, popularity bias, fairness, and diversity. And we so use these models and apply them as post-processing step to solve the top K recommendation problem. Therefore, we recommend exactly k many items to every users using already estimated ratings matrices. Our contribution is to offer these models for each criterion in such a way that they are firstly flexible, so they are data independent. And because they are data independent, they just work with different data sets without requiring modifications. And if we can obtain estimated ratings metrics, they should work with every data set. Secondly, our models are simple because they are easy to create and intuitive to understand. And lastly, they are easy to combine. And therefore, we can mix and match different sub problems according to the problem at hand. There are other specialized algorithms in the literature for each of these other criteria, but modifying those algorithms or including new criteria on top of the already existing ones are not trivial. For example, in our models, if diverse criterion is not important, we can just exclude them and include other constraints that deals with other criteria. Uh, you can think this as an auto meal where you have the base as your food and you decide which toppings you want to eat that day. And if your problem requires some of the toppings, you choose them as different constraints and it's very easy to do. So I'm not going to go into details of the models and constraints because of the because of the time issue. But basically, the base model maximizes the average rating, as in equation one, and it ensures every solution recommends exactly k items to every users. So our first, so if if we talk about our oatmeal example, this is our base, and now we will we will talk about the toppings and First one is the popularity bias. So popularity bias is the problem of offering more popular items more frequently to users, while other unpopular items do not get enough recommendations. And our solution to this problem is to add constraints of type four. Uh, therefore, we add upper bounds for total popularity of recommended items to alleviate the problem of recommending lots of popular items. Our Metric of choices are average recommended popularity and aggregate diversity. So here are the results that we compare our pop opt with. We compare our results with X squad using move last 1 million data set. And in both metrics, our approach performs better. Our second sub problem is provider fairness. Typically in provider fairness problem, problems, there is a lower bound applied to every item in the system or every provider in the system, such that they are getting recommendations at least a couple of times. And this elevates unfairness recommendations. However, this can result in some items getting significantly more recommendations than others. And to elevate this problem, we suggest adding upper bounds as well as lower bounds. So we recommend every item in an interval, basically. And the, we compared our model with fair rec heuristic. And we left graph is without adding upper bounds, and right graph is with adding upper bounds. In, and in both settings, we can beat fair rec according to the metric Z set uh, inequality in producer exposures. Our last model is diverse to model. So in this case, Basically, in Movelance 1 million dataset, we give each item one genre, and we, we try to offer every user at least W many different genres to elevate diverse problems. So it will everyone will get a diverse list. And our metric of choice for subproblem is interlistability, and we compare our model with a simple weighted average relevance uh, heuristic denoted as WS. And two models perform very similarly, except WS performs worse around ILS zero because it has significantly less average rating than our uh, diverse model. 
So com co combining different criteria with each other is trivial in our paper because all the models have the same objective function and we can combine, combine the models by adding the constraints together and that's it. So our comp op opt includes all the constraints we proposed in this paper and everyone can mix and match their toppings as they as they want so if you are interested in only fairness you can only include only fairness if you want fair and diverse settings then you can add to constraints of those two sub sub problems and here are the and comp opt usually can elevate all the problems at the same time because that's the aim but it also it's very competitive with the specialized algorithms as well and we we consider three main future research directions. First is scalability, how to solve large problems. Second one is feasibility. What if there is just no solutions because our constraints are too tight? And we should definitely check other data sets uh, to get more insight how our com combined model works. And we offer some solutions to all of these points in our paper. And if you are interested in you should the check and these are the models we used for comparison purposes and if you are also interested in here you can check them as well and thank you for listening have a good day we present a multi-stakeholder recommendation system to promote business diversification by taking into account the objectives of public and private stakeholders the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the fragility of European industrial strategies. We have observed supply disruptions that have affected entire sectors of the economy and generated shortages of essential goods. At the same time, we discovered that some companies were able to quickly adapt their production to produce the hydraulic shell, for example, or the, or the productive equipment that was missing. The question is, can open data and data science help territories rebuild a more sustainable productive system? The architecture of our recommender system is based on three processes. First, a territorialization of production data from open data on the typology of production units as well as half hour models on the proximity of know how we can model the production of a territory to better understand who manufactures what and who could potentially manufacture what. Then, we will formalize a number of economic objectives for companies and public authorities, economic growth, competitive advantage, productive resilience, and favoring ecological and essential products. Finally, we present the multi-objective recommendation engine. The first part of our recommendation system is the territorialization of production data. We map the companies. To do this, we have retrieved the Sirene Open Database of French companies. Here are represented the companies of Fusion France classified by sector of activity. From a table of correspondence, we obtain the theoretical productions associated with each company. We now wish to identify the potential productive jumps for the companies. To do this, we will rely on the work of Harvard University. Harvard provides an open data table of proximity between each class of products. The product space allows us to visualize the productive opportunities associated with the type of product. We now describe the different objectives. The first objective is to diversify production. We rely on proximity data between product classes. The proximity between two products, P1 and P2, is obtained by calculating the number of times the two products are co-exported by countries that have competitive advantage of the two products. This objective is calculated from the open data files of exports by countries or and by product classes. The second objective is to increase the competitive advantage associated with the company's productions. Thanks to the fo following formula, we measure a territorialized competitive advantage taking into account the local demand. To calculate this objective, we need local export data by territory. 
Economic performance is related to economic complexity of productions. For the diversity and ubiquity data associated with each product class, we obtain a formula allowing us to calculate the complexity of each product. This objective is calculated from the export data by country and by product class. The fourth objective consists in orienting the productions toward products whose supply chain are more resilient. We will use formulas from the theory of dynamicism. From the analysis of flows between countries, we obtain the efficiency and the redundancy of each distribution network. By combining these two measures, we can determine a level of resilience associated with each product class. Our fifth objective is to promote the products of first necessity. To do this, we rely on an original study that associates each product class with a category in Maslow's pyramid. Then, our goal is to promote environmentally friendly products. There are several lists of ecological products and we have chosen the APEC list. Let's introduce the recommendation system. We have chosen a rather simple recommendation system in which we weigh each objective before realizing the associated scores. We consider the weighting of the system corresponding to the choice of territorial policy. We implemented the recommender system. It is an interface to weight each objective and dynamically visualize the result on the right. In the center is a product currently proposed by the company. Around this product, we dynamically display the recommended product options. To conclude, stakeholders whose strategies are sometimes opposed can find a solution in the recommendation system that takes their objectives into account. We explored the field of recommendation, information theory, and economics to find objectives that can be integrated in a multi objective recommendation system. We will continue our work by validating the system on territory. We also consider a part to efficient hybridation to meet the local authorities in setting the weight of the system. Hi there. I hope that you are hungry for some knowledge because uh, I would like to present our paper on the cholesterol factor. Uh, it's fully titled Balancing Accuracy and Health in Recipe Recommendation Through a Nutrient-Specific Metric. So this is work I've done uh, as me, Alain Starke, together with Christoph Tratner, Hedda Bakken, Martin Johannesson, and Vega Solberg. And in this presentation, I will show that uh, a post-filtering metric based on nutritional guidelines can boost the healthiness of a list of recipe recommendations. And while an increase in healthiness does come at the cost of accuracy, if you only put a small weight, say 10 to 15% on this metric, there is a pretty sharp increase in health while accuracy is only minimally diminished. So food, we're gonna consider this in this presentation as a multi-objective optimization problem. And you can see in the literature that food recommenders either cater to user preferences, where you have all sorts of traditional recommender approaches where based on recipes that contain ingredients that a user liked in the past, you recommend more of those recipes that contain similar ingredients. So if you like potatoes in the past, you get potatoes in the future. There are also recommenders that are more focused on nutritional needs. So uh, there have been studies that try to control for users uh, eating goals, but also whether they are missing some specific nutrients based on their purchases. The third category is of course where it gets interesting and a multi-objective optimization problem is where you can balance these two. And in that category, you have pre-filtering approaches, such as through constraint-based recommenders and recommenders that optimize across multiple nutrients. But there are more often post-filtering approaches where I do a re-ranking of the recommendation set based on a specific feature. 
So post-filtering metrics, uh, that's what we're gonna develop here in this study. So based on nutritional guidelines from the Norwegian Directorate of Health, we have come up with a scoring system. So based on the fat content, saturated fat or sugar content uh, of a recipe, uh, a certain recipe can score either minus 15 on this cholesterol uh, factor, which means it is very unhealthy, or plus 15, which means it is very healthy. And if it scores above zero, then it's more or less is in line with the guidelines of the Norwegian Directorate of Health. And we use this to come up with a post-filtering rating. So we have a predicted rating based on an offline evaluation, and then based on the cholesterol weight and the cholesterol score, we recalculate that rating. The cholesterol weight, as indicated by the arrow, is the factor that can be manipulated, and that's what we will look into in the study. So our contribution is that we have this nutrient-based post-filtering metric, and we're gonna compare different recommender approaches using different weights for our metric. Uh, we performed offline evaluation on a data set from allrecipes.com. We had just over 1,000 recipes that contained over 50,000 ratings. And the ratings were on average pretty high. So the mean rating given was uh, 4.32, um so most ratings given on this recipe website were actually quite positive which was in part a bit of a challenge to uh, analyze this data and yeah beyond that of all recipes we have um, information on the nutrients the nutritional values so we could actually compute uh, the cholesterol score so for the offline evaluation we have the following results. We compared uh, four different approaches, a random item recommendation baseline, uh, an SVD matrix factorization, a hybrid uh, of content-based and collaborative filtering and a content-based. So as you can see from based on position at 10, recall 10 and the uh, mean average error, uh, that SVD outperformed the other approaches, not by much, but it at least seemed to work best. On top of that, uh, it was also computationally less demanding than the hybrid approach. So here is where we examine the post-filtering. So what would happen if we apply different weights of our cholesterol factor uh, to the cholesterol score? So this cholesterol score, keep that in mind, it can be anything between minus 15 to plus 15. And as you can see, when you increase the weight, say up to uh, 10%, um, then the cholesterol score will increase from, let's say, around zero to, to five, which is yeah, pretty much quite healthier than uh, where it was at its start. You can also see that precision and recall didn't really uh, decrease that much while the mean average error increased a little bit. Uh, so that's quite a simple gain uh, to have if you are, as a system designer, interested in boosting the healthiness of recipe recommendations, this is a simple thing you can do. If you would increase the cholesterol weight further, it doesn't really lead to much more health benefits in this data set. Uh, it does make the predictions uh, worse in terms of all the metrics that we have. So it seems that around 10 to 15%, that's the optimal uh, thing to do. So the main takeaways uh, in this, let's say, pretty much work in progress study uh, is that recommendation health does come at the cost of accuracy. But if you can already boost health a little bit by putting a little bit of weight on specific nutrients without really diminishing the accuracy of the recommendation set. And post-filtering is also not computationally heavy. So I think it's quite a straightforward approach to implement. Uh, this was, of course, a rather simple study, and I think in the future, uh, it's also important that more user factors and user characteristics are incorporated in the recommendation approach, so that um, not only the recommendations can be better, but that also specific dietary constraints, for example, can be incorporated. Well, here is a very healthy chocolate cake. Thank you for listening, and uh, I would love to hear any questions you have.
Hi, my name is Sasha Sturkov, and I'd like to talk to you about the evaluation of music recommendations. This is joint work with Hongyi Wen, who I met at the Digital Life Initiative Seminar at Cornell Tech, a seminar that talks about um, issues, sociological issues around algorithms. And um, what I was uh, working on is I had a, collected a binary data set that I thought might be useful to him. And when we started talking over many Zooms, uh, we realized that it in fact could be used for evaluating the, uh, the stakeholders of a recommendation algorithm. So um, when we studied the, the data sets that were out there, we realized that one big type of data set is the explicit feedback data sets where users are actually aware that they are giving a rating to, to an item. Um, and we found that many of them uh, had the self-selection bias. In other words, uh, only a certain type of person uh, rates and the people who rate are often biased towards people who like things. And, um, and as you can see on YouTube, a video with 58 million views typically has 2 million views and 40,000, uh, sorry, 2 million likes and 40,000 dislikes. And same with Amazon customer reviews and uh, maybe the worst offender, Uber, um, who uh, mostly has drivers that have scores higher than 4.9. So um, we realized that something about the explicit data sets would, seemed to be quite biased. Um, on the other hand, uh, implicit user item data sets we found to be quite noisy. So um, typically uh, these uh, are data sets where the user is not explicitly making a rating, but is behaving in an app and the app or the algorithm is trying to figure out uh, what they like. And typically, uh, say in music, if an item is played, it may be labeled as one, um, which may have just been passively played in a playlist and may not be an endorsement of the song. On the other hand, items or songs that are not played, which are a big majority of, app, of the music uh, is just not never heard by a listener. Uh, those are typically labeled by zero and algorithms are trained on this kind of data set. So again, very imbalanced towards the zeros or uh, making this assumption that a song that's not been listened is not would not be liked. So um, the data set that, uh, that I've used to collect the, the data, the Picky music data set is the Picky interface, which is an app that uh, the main dynamic is that the users press this, uh, the picky button and they see a music video, which after three seconds, uh, they're allowed to dislike or skip. After six seconds, they are allowed to like it. And after 12 seconds, they can super like it. After 30 seconds, the video clip ends and they may replay it or go on to the next. So this is how the, the data is collected. The Picky Music dataset, which is uh, made of 500,000 rows, is available on my GitHub. But essentially, it's composed of user IDs, song IDs, whether the song was liked or disliked or super liked by the user, whether uh, it came from a personalized or a random algorithm, and finally, the, the popularity on Spotify, zero being the lesser well-known artist and 100 the most famous ones. So as you can see on the x-axis, I have Spotify popularity. On the y-axis, uh, I aggregated uh, the data set to show how uh, what liked ratio um, artists of a given popularity was. And as you can see, pickiness is correlated with Spotify popularity. And, um, and around 50, so the middle of this chart, uh, we've chosen this as a threshold to classify the lesser known artists to the left and the more uh, well-known artists on the right. So the stakeholders that we're looking at are the consumers, the well-known artists and the lesser known artists. And, and we've designed uh, metrics to measure what each of these um, 
stakeholders might have. The consumers, for example, don't care whether a song is uh, from a well-known or a lesser known artist, they just uh, vote on whether they like it or not. And both of these categories, lesser known and well-known artists, we are going to track the percentage or the hit rate that different algorithms have. So the way um, we've trained this algorithm is, in, is we've trained the classic WRMF algorithm, which typically is trained on only likes data, where, so these are the uh, user ratings that are uh, positive. Here are the user ratings that are uh, negative, and here are the missing user feedback. And if we are gonna tr train on an implicit data set, uh, these weights, uh, alpha and gamma 2.5, represent um, how uh, you would train uh, an algorithm with implicit data. What we have here is at our disposal are likes and dislikes, and it allows us to train the algorithm on both likes and dislikes. And what we find after trying a few pop obvious popularity and anti-popularity benchmarks is that if a WRMF is trained only on likes, it satisfies all stakeholders around 50%. And if it is trained on the likes and the dislikes, the algorithm is able to have a 20% pickup for every stakeholder. So um, the next step for us is to uh, design more metrics on this data set. We are very interested in uh, how it can help um, you know, train other algorithms potentially to see whether, how they compete. And uh, finally, we're interested in um, the stakeholders, the other stakeholders that we haven't considered. Um, such as labels or even uh, the music platforms themselves.